Hey North Coast, uh, welcome this morning and uh, I have Abby here with me. And Abby, what day is today? Sunday! What also is today? My last day of interning at NCFF. Oh man, man. Well Abby, we just want to know um, what's been one experience that you've had that you'll cherish from your internship here at North Coast? Well, wow. It's been amazing overall being here, but honestly, I never would have imagined that I would have worked in a ministry setting. Like, I never would have thought I'd be working with students, be doing announcements for once, working at a church in general. So it has just been tremendous. And like building these new connections and strengthening new ones and just learning so much from tech and everything to being part of a team and working with the amazing leadership team has been, has been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I just want to ask, is there any encouragement that we want to leave North Coast with? Well, if you're offered an internship here, take it. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but in all honesty, like, like, get involved here. I mean, it's just such an amazing community, and this is a church family that you want to be a part of. And also, like I was saying, um, I never would have imagined that I would have worked in a ministry setting. So, you know, when God opens these doors that just seem just so out of what you would imagine, walk through them because He will be right there with you. Well, Abby, just so you know, from the bottom of our heart here at North Coast, so we're just really excited that we were a part of your journey here. and. Um, we'll actually continue to be a part of your journey and I just kind of wanted to know like what's next for Abby? So I'll be transferring to Western Oregon University But I was supposed to go in person, but sadly it will be online, but it's okay. It is what it is So Abby it is now time for our morning announcements So one last time take it away Here are a few announcements for you this morning Did you check out one of these, well, you'll want to because you'll get to learn more about what's happening this week at North Coast. Sermon notes and a connect card. We'd love it if you'd please fill out a connect card as it pertains to you. After you've filled out a connect card, drop it in the offering during worship and we will reach out to you. North Coast supports the Coast Pregnancy Clinic and their annual baby bottle campaign has begun. Simply take a bottle, fill it with cash, coins, or a check, and bring it back this month. These donations support this amazing faith-based clinic as they offer free services to families in need of things like pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, baby supplies, prayer, and more. Your support could help a family choose life. Thank you. Are you a lady interested in joining a Bible study this fall? Well, look no further because North Coast Women's Ministry is starting back up on September 21st. We'll be going through The Struggle is Real by Nicole Unis on Mondays at 6. This will be a great study to help us ladies get smart about life together. If you're interested in joining, please make a note in your connect card, drop it in the offering during worship, and we will get you signed up. Thanks, North Coast. Again, I just want to thank you all so much. My time interning here at North Coast Family Fellowship has been a blessing in just so many ways, and it has been my favorite job thus far. Until the next one, <laughs> may you have a wonderful Sunday. Hello, North Coast, North Coast family, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we're so happy to have you here online. Uh, before we begin our time of worship, our call to worship will be from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. So please follow along with me. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive and find grace to help in time of need. 
As we continue in our series through 1 John, we see again and again the very personal and relational character of Jesus. And so I pray that as we go into the service today, as we call upon his mercy and his grace, that we can continue to develop our relationship with him, or if this is our first time doing that, uh, that we can enter into a relationship with Jesus knowing that he has experienced what we experience here on earth. Also, before worship today, we wanted to go into prayer for um, all the communities that are being torn apart by the wildfires here in Oregon and also in Northern California. So will you please join me in prayer today? God, I thank you for your um, wonderful love and and grace for us, God. And I just pray as we um, have to deal with all of these horrible atrocities that happen around the world, natural disasters that are out of our hands, God, that and we can continue to trust in your plan for us and your plan for your creation, God. Uh, I pray for all the families and the communities that are um, fighting these deadly fires, God, that you can just be protecting them and taking care of them and letting them know that you are there for them and that you are caring for them, God. I pray as we go into our time of worship today that we can continue to trust in you and your great plan for us and our lives. I pray all this in your name. Amen. and praying as my soul longs only for you. So I'm gathering wood for the fire. I'm filling my lamp with the oil. Oh Lord, in the season of waiting, let my heart burn. Turn. 
Hey everybody, welcome to NCFF Online. Excited to be able to share God's Word with you this morning. And I'm going to draw your attention to 1 John chapter 1 and verses 5 to 10, picking up where we left off last week. And this is what John wrote to us. He said, This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, then we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So hey, I wanna start uh, the message with uh, a bit of a confession. And the confession is this, I had actually planned on preaching and teaching that whole passage that I just read to you. But as I started out in in verse one, I came across this, this phrase, God is light. And I have to admit, guys, that I could not get past it. God is light. What does that mean? Uh, What's the implications of a statement like that? When was the last time I actually heard anybody just take that simple phrase and plummet the depths of its meaning? And it was just too wonderful a concept for me to get by quickly. So today, what we're going to do is just look at that singular phrase, out of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 that says, God is light. And my hope and prayer is that you're going to enjoy this study as much as I did personally, and that out of it, you will have an enhanced sense of awe for our God, who is the God that is light, that you will have this sense of appreciation for Jesus because he is the God that is light, and that you will have this sense of wanting to take action in order to let the light shine uh, all around the world that God has placed us in. So let's just back up for a moment. First John chapter one, verses one to four, the passage that we studied last Sunday, it paints for us a picture of Jesus. Quite truthfully, guys, it is absolutely wonderful, but I think is also a little bit intimidating. And here's why I would say that. We saw last week that Jesus is the eternal God. Before time began, he existed. He is eternal. We saw that he is the son of God, that he is co-equal with the father, that he is co-equal with the son. We saw that he is the source of life, which means that Jesus is the creator God of all the universe. And I got to admit, when you add this stuff up, this is quite a resume. This is a very, very impressive set of credentials. And the truth is, when you start thinking on this and contemplating who Jesus is, yeah, it should be a little bit intimidating to us. I like what the uh, what James said in chapter two and verse nineteen of his book. He's talking actually about demons, but but listen to this. It says you you believe that there is one God. He says, well, that's good, that's fine. But the demons believe this too, and they shake with fear. Isn't it interesting? Jesus, his resume, his credentials, yeah, they're intimidating. Even the demons are intimidated by the greatness of our majestic Christ. Well, as we get into uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 today, we're going we're gonna to learn some things about Jesus that are going to make him seem even more intimidating. But I want to stop you there, and I want to just say this. Uh, please keep this in mind about this magnificent Jesus, this majestic Jesus, this mighty Jesus, this Jesus that is too big for our minds to take in. Please realize that our Lord has never been about intimidating you. He's never been about intimidating me. In fact, what he is about is he desires intimacy 
not intimidation, but intimacy with the likes of you and with the likes of me. The great thing about our Lord is that the more we really know him, the more intimate our relationship with him will grow. The more we really understand who he is, the more the opportunity to grow in intimacy with this Lord who loves us with all of his heart. So looking here at uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, we're going to start with these words. And this is what John wrote. This is the message we have heard from Jesus and it is the message we now declare to you. I love that phrase, the message. It sets the context for what's happening in the book of John. The picture, again, is that of a, of a senior man, the Apostle John. He's 90 plus years old. And John is writing uh, basically his memoirs. But the interesting thing about that is that his memoirs aren't really about himself. They are about the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is the message of John's life. He is the story that John has spent his entire life telling anyone who would listen, telling them about Jesus, who he is and what it means to follow him and how Christ is the savior of the world. We saw this last week that Jesus is the story we were created to tell. Jesus is the song we were created to sing. John said Jesus is the person that we were created uh, to proclaim. And so as he begins proclaiming the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, he just, he just throws out this comment that God is light. Look at the full verse. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Last week I, I shared with you that the Apostle John, when, when he wrote his book, he used very, very simple vocabulary terms. And, and somehow, using these simple words, he was able to express uh, the deepest of thoughts. Well, this simple phrase, God is light, this is classic John the Apostle. God is light is easy to say in English. It is easy to say in Greek. So you've got this rough and tough fisherman guy. He's using easy to understand words and he drops them into your lap and he drops them into my lap. And with them comes one of the most profound concepts ever communicated from the throne of God to the heart of man. Realize this, simple terms, profound concept, straight from God, straight to you. That's amazing. Honestly, we could take 10,000 years to plummet the depths of a statement like God is light, and at the end of that time, we would only be scratching the surface in terms of what it means. Think about it. Think about it with me in terms of its implications. John is telling us that God is light itself. God is light itself. John is telling us that Jesus doesn't simply reflect light like a mirror or like the moon. God isn't merely a source of light, like a, a torch, a tiki torch, or, 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 or some kind of light bulb. Jesus isn't lit up by light like a celebrity on the red carpet, carpet, you know, there at the Oscars. No, he's saying God is actually light itself. It's, it's who he is. It is his, his nature. It is his essence. Light is the very manner in which God exists. The Apostle John, or, or Paul rather, understood this as well as John. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16 these words, God alone is immortal. God alone, listen now, lives in unapproachable light. No one has seen him or can see him. Because if you approach God, you're fried, you're toast, you're done. And then, and then Paul, as he writes this, 
that God is immortal and lives in unapproachable light, he says, to this God be honor and power forever. Amen. I love that. When Paul thought about the light of God, even though he had never seen it, he immediately went to praise and he immediately went to worship. Indeed, the teaching that God is light is infinite. There is no way that I could tell you all that it means because, well, the truth is, I'm not that smart and you don't have that much time. So we're just going to look at a few things that come right out of Scripture today that tell us what that little phrase, God is light, well, what it's all about. So let's, uh, let's begin with this. Our God of light is the God of life. Our God of light is the God of life. That's the first thing it means. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 36 and verse 9. He says, Lord, you are the fountain of life. You are the light by which we see. Now, in this uh, verse, King David, the writer of the Psalms, is using what is called Hebrew parallelism in terms of literature. And he's using two different statements, but he's tying them together to say the same thing. And so what David is doing using Hebrew parallelism is he is equating life and light. And he's teaching us that this God of light, he is the one who who created life. He is the one who sustains life. Light and life are, are synonymous when it comes to God Almighty. Second thing he's telling us when it comes to our God of light is this. Our God of light is the God of protection and he is the God of guidance. The God of protection and the God of guidance. And and you see this illustrated uh, when, when the Lord took the nation of Israel out of captivity from Egypt and he brought him in, brought that nation into the desert. And they're all afraid, how are we going to find our way through the desert? And where are we going to find water? Where are we going to get food? God took care of all of those things. And one of the things he did is he created a cloud to guide them by the day and a a pillar of fire or of light to guide them at night. And, And Moses writes about this in Exodus chapter 13 in verse 21 when he says, The Lord guided them, that's Israel, out in the desert, by a pillar of cloud during the day and by a pillar of fire or of light at night. That way, listen to this, that way they could travel whether it was day or night. I love that last phrase in particular. God is our pillar of light. He is our pillar of fire today. And that way you and I can travel through life, whether it's daytime or nighttime, we have a God who is constantly there to protect you and to protect me, to guide you and to guide me. And you know, guys, I, again, as, as I talk with people going through COVID-19, I, I talk with moms and dads who are wondering, what are we going to do with our kids, you know, schooling-wise, as I talk with people in our church who have recently lost loved ones and there's you know for me it's just it's just such a blessing to remind them as well as to remind myself that i'm never alone that the god of light is always with me and he's made this promise john i'm going to protect you john i'm going to guide you just open your eyes open your heart and follow me That's our God of light. Third thing about our God of light is, and this is pretty cool, is that he is the God of ultimate radiant glory. Of ultimate radiant glory. Again, a couple verses out of the Psalms. Psalm 104, verses 1 to 2. David just says, O my soul, bless God. 
God, my God, how great you are. And then he says, you are beautifully and gloriously robed. You are dressed in light. Guys, the God of light is so glorious, dressed in light, that when you are around him, the glory of God, and when you're physically around him, even though you can't see him and, and, and he, he doesn't like fry you and burn you up because he's protecting you, but when you're around him physically, that glory of his rubs off on you. I mean, think of the story of Moses. We're told in Exodus chapter 34, Moses goes up to the, to the top of a mountain. He receives the Ten Commandments. He's talking to God. He's praying and God's talking with him. He comes on back down to the people of Israel and Moses is just like glowing. The glory of God had stuck upon him. It rubbed off. So much so that it says that the people of Israel had to turn away from his faith, face. It was so bright and he had to wear a veil when he talked to the people of Israel. And then you've got an example in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, which talks about angels uh, dressed in light, the glory of God. It rubs off on the angels. And then when you read through Colossians chapter one, it tells us that the glory of God rubs off on, onto the saints that are in heaven. That's amazing. The glory of God is so radiant, is so uh, ultimate, that when you're anywhere close to him, his glory is going to rub off on you and on me. Now, that doesn't happen to us today physically because God is in heaven and we're here on earth. But I, I do want to say this. I have met many, many Christians over the course of my life, that there is an inner glow that I believe radiates the glory of Jesus Christ. There's just something about them. It shows up in their words. It, is, uh, it just blows out of their attitude. Uh, you, can, you, you can just tell yourself, I see it in their eyes. I see it in the countenance of their face. Our God of light will transform us from the inside out so that as people look at us, they may not see physically, but they will sense intuitively that the glory of God is upon us because we know the God that is light. There's a fourth thing to tell you about um, this God of ours who is light. Our God of light is the God of truth. Our God of light is the God of truth. In Psalms 119 and verse 105, David wrote, he said, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet. It is a light to my path. And then I love Psalms 43 and verse three, where he says, God, let your light and truth shine on me. Your light and truth will guide me. Now catch this next line. They will they will lead me home. They will lead me home. What an incredibly tender phrase from the compassionate heart of our God who is light. <laughs> you know, there's that crazy hotel commercial, we'll leave the light on. Well, well God is the light. He leaves the light on. His life and light to you and to me, so that he is free to lead us home throughout the course of this life. Lead us home to himself. There's a fifth thing about this whole concept that God is light. Our God of light, well, he is the God of the gospel. Our God of light, scripture tells us, is the God of the gospel. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Apostle Paul describes this for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. He says, Satan, which is the title, of course, for the devil, for Lucifer, Satan, the god of this evil world, he has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe so that they are unable, so that they can't see 
the glorious light of the good news, which is what the word gospel means. They can't see the glorious light of the good news, the gospel, that is shining upon them. As a result, Paul writes, they don't understand the message that we preach about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. There's something about the gospel, guys. It is the light of God. When we share with other people about Jesus, when we share with other people that they're in darkness, but they can walk out of the darkness into the light by embracing Jesus as their God, their Savior, and their Lord by surrendering their lives to him. Guys, the light comes on and the gospel is seen and the good news is received and lives are transformed. But Satan is working overtime. We need to remember this. All of, all of life is a spiritual battle. Satan is working overtime to blind people. And our great privilege, like, a, like a, a doctor who can do surgery on the eyes and who can take away the cataract and all of a sudden you can see everything clearly. Like that, we are sent out into the world to help blind people discover the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, a number of years now I, I, ago, I, I had some cataracts pulled off of both my eyes. My eyesight was terrible. And when those things were taken off, I was blown away by how much my sight was improved. I mean, if you would have seen the old glasses I had, they were like Coke bottle bottoms, horrible. Every day I wake up now, no kidding, and I'm like, Lord, thank you for my eyesight. I still can't believe that I can see clearly. And that's, that's the story of the gospel, that people will be able to see clearly the God who is light and the God who gives life and the God who changes everything about how we see life and how we live life. Number six, our God of light is the God named Jesus. Our God of light is the God named Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, guys, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And then Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, God has made us understand that this light is the brightness of the glory of God that is, listen now, seen in the face of Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. The face of Jesus, the light of God. That's our Savior, guys. That's our Lord. No wonder at, at his name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Number seven, when we talk about the God of light, I've learned that our God of light, well, he is the God who has given you every good thing you've ever had or ever will have. Think about that. The God of light, we're told in the Bible, is the one who has given you every good thing you've ever had or that you will ever have. Again, the book of James, but this time, chapter one and verse 17, the writer says, every good and perfect gift ever given comes to us from above, it comes down from, listen now, it comes down from the Father of lights to you and to me. Take a minute. Is there anything good in your life? Anything good happened to you today? Do you have some good people around you? Do you, do you live in a good place? Do you have some, some good friends? Have you heard some good worship music this morning? Have you had a sense of how good God is to you? Man, realize that the God who is light, the Father of lights, has personally handpicked every single good thing you've ever experienced, and he's the one responsible for bringing that to your life. And all the good things that are gonna come your way in the future, he's the one the Father of lights, who's going to put them in your life. Number eight, the God of light will eternally 
light up eternity all by himself. The God of light will light up eternity all by himself. I, I, I just think this is amazing. Uh, speaking about God's plans for forever, the Apostle John writes about the future in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. And this is what he says, it being a reference to the eternal city, to heaven, it will not need the sun to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and the lamb, a reference to Jesus, is its lamp. In fact, he says, there will be no more night. And why is that? Because the people of God will not need the light of the sun for the Lord God himself will give them light. He will be the light, no sun, because God will fill the new heavens and the new earth and all of eternity with his glorious light. I love the power and the picture of his majesty and might that those words capture for us. Now we've got some exciting things to look ahead to when it comes to the future. One last thing, guys, uh, about, about the God of light. Our God of light, well, he is the God of perfect holiness. Our God of light is the God of perfect holiness. And beloved, this, this brings us full circle back to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Because this is what he writes, God is light. And the word here means holy. God is holy and in him there is no darkness. That little phrase, no darkness, means sin. And in him there is no sin at all. God is holy, and in him there is no sin at all. This is a powerful verse, guys. This verse takes us to the very core, to the very essence of who God is. I love the way one writer captures it. He says this, God is all light. There is zero darkness in him. But what does this mean? It means that, uh, that God is all good with, with no sin. He is all pure with no impurities. He is clean with nothing dirty. He is right with nothing wrong. He is all truth. And this is vitally important because without his light of purity and holiness in our own lives, we dwell in nothing but constant spiritual darkness. It is a simple fact that in this physical world, as well as the spiritual world, darkness cannot continue when it encounters light. Light always dispels the darkness. Guys, Jesus, the light, wants to constantly dispel the darkness and the sin that bombards your life and mine. Thank you, Jesus, for being there for us. Two takeaways from today's message that I want to share with you. Two words. I hope you sense these words because in my study, I've sensed this within my own heart. And the first word is awe. Awe. A-W-E. God is awesome. No one else is. Nothing else is. We should reserve that word for God alone. And Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, writing to Christians, he says, Guys, you're a chosen race. You're the royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession. And here's why. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into, listen to these words, into his marvelous light. His marvelous light. Guys, proclaim this. I've been set free. I'm out of darkness. And I'm walking in the light of Almighty God. That's the sense of awe. Again, thank you, Lord, for reaching down into the filth and dirt of this planet and grabbing a person like me and people like you, taking us out of darkness and planting us into his light. No more blindness. No more blindness. And then the second word is action. Action. Guys, 
when we realize that our God is light and we understand just a few of the things that this phrase means, it's got to move your heart to, to action. If in any way, shape, or form the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, right now you've got to have the sense within you, what can God, the God of light, use me to do? Well, Paul thought about this, and this is what he wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 8 to 9. He said, guys, you used to be like people living in darkness, living in sin. But now you are people of the light. You are people of holiness. Now you belong to the Lord. You belong to the Lord, guys. That's a context. That's a context of love. And so he says, out of this context of light and love, so then act like people of the light and let your light shine. And you're like, well, how do I do that? And, this, and he tells us exactly how to do it. Three things. Do good, live honestly, and be truthful. Do good, live honestly, and be truthful. That's what it means to be children of the light. And that's the action, the sort of action that the Holy Spirit wants to put you and wants to put me right into the middle of. People who will bring goodness into whatever context we're placed. People who will not deceive, but who will be honest. And people of the truth, who will bring the truth of God's light, of God's life, of God's love, and share it with everyone. Family, friends, neighbors, workers, students, even people we're not even necessarily drawn to. That we're going to do all of these things because we are the children of the light. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for letting us be children of the light. Thank you that you are the God who is light. Thank you, Lord, that we just scratched the surface a bit today, but thank you for these things we've learned about you. God, fill our hearts with a sense of awe in your presence. And then, Lord, take us and put us into action to be the people of the light who are letting your light shine through us into a darkened world. We love you. We praise you. Pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Guys, uh, real quick, I want to share the light with you. If you've never uh, realized that you're separated from God, well, part of the story of the light is to tell you the truth, and, and you are. You're separated from God because of sin, but there's a way to deal with that. And that you just simply go to Jesus and you admit that you're a sinner. I, I did that. I am a sinner, and I did that years ago, and I just said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and would you please forgive me? And he said, yes. And he said, I'll, I'll make you my son. I'll make you my child. I'll put my Holy Spirit within you. I will be your God of light and I will guide you. And John, one day I'll take you home to be with myself. That's the gospel. Jesus wants to do that for you. How does that happen? You pray, you ask him to forgive you. You place your life, you surrender your life to him. And you place your life into his hands. And when you do that, the Bible says, you're born again. Hey, if you need uh, some help in understanding that, give our office a call, shoot me a text or send me an email or whatever, and we would be more than happy to talk with you some more about this. Uh, God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And uh, I hope that uh, these songs of praise and these words from scripture have lit your heart of fire today.